Have you ever wondered what makes an airplane fly? There are four forces acting on an airplane in flight. These forces are lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The study of these forces and their role in flight is known as aerodynamics. In this section, we will discuss how these forces work together to achieve straight and level, unaccelerated flight. This means that the airplane isn't turning, climbing, descending, or changing airspeed. It should be fairly clear that before an airplane can fly, lift must be created. Lift is the upward force created by the effect of airflow as it passes around the wings. Weight is the force that opposes lift and is caused by the downward pull of gravity. Thrust, created by the power plant, propels the airplane forward through the air, while drag opposes thrust. If both of these forces remain equal, the airplane will not speed up or slow down. Before we get into the principle that explains how lift is created, let's look at some of the terminology used in this section. A line drawn from the leading edge to the trailing edge of an airfoil is referred to as the cord line. The camber of an airfoil is the curve of its surface. On general aviation training aircraft, the upper camber is usually more pronounced than the lower camber. Any object moving through the air encounters a relative wind. This wind is always parallel to and opposite the flight path. The angle formed between the relative wind and the cord line is called the angle of attack. The principle behind lift was discovered by a Swiss physicist named Bernoulli when he observed what happened to air as it passed through a tube. The principle simply states that as the velocity of a fluid or gas increases, its pressure decreases. He also found that with a constant velocity, the pressure of the air remains the same at both ends of the tube. If a constriction is placed in the middle of the tube, the same amount of air has to go through a smaller area. This increases the velocity and decreases the pressure. If you were to replace the constriction with an airfoil, such as a wing, the same principle would still apply. As oncoming air meets at the leading edge of the airfoil, it separates with part of the airflow going over the top and part going below. Since the air flowing over the top has farther to go, it must travel faster. The result is lower air pressure above the wing. Because higher pressure tends to flow toward areas of lower pressure, the airfoil or wing is lifted. This accounts for about 75% of lift. The remaining lift is provided by the downward deflection of air as it strikes the bottom of the wing. This can be explained by Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The reaction to the air striking the bottom of the wing is an upward or lifting force. The amount of lift that a wing can produce depends on several factors. One of these factors is wing design, which includes the shape or plan form of the wing. A straight wing has good slow flight characteristics, but is not structurally efficient in terms of lift and drag. A swept back or delta wing is much better at higher speeds. The tapered wing, on the other hand, has good slow flight characteristics and has a relatively efficient design. Another wing design factor is the aspect ratio, or the relationship between the wing's length and width. The aspect ratio can be found by dividing the wing span by the average cord. In this example, the wing has an aspect ratio of 9. At a given angle of attack, the larger the aspect ratio, the less drag produced for the same amount of lift. General aviation training aircraft, for instance, normally have aspect ratios of 7 to 9, while gliders are usually between 20 and 30. You as a pilot can control lift by changing individually or in combination 
the airplane's airspeed, its angle of attack, and the wing configuration, such as lowering the flaps. If all other factors remain constant, doubling an airplane's airspeed develops four times more lift. This increase, however, is not without its drawbacks, because along with any increase in lift, you also get an increase in drag. In addition, with all other factors remaining constant, an increase in angle of attack increases lift. For lift to remain constant, airspeed and angle of attack must be used in conjunction with each other. If airspeed increases, you must decrease angle of attack. Conversely, if you want to maintain the same amount of lift at a slower airspeed, you must increase the angle of attack. However, angle of attack can only be increased so far. For every wing, there is a specific angle of attack where the maximum amount of lift is obtained. This point is called CL max, or the maximum coefficient of lift. Beyond this point, the airflow will not remain smooth over the wing, as shown by this water tank demonstration. It becomes so turbulent that the airfoil can no longer create lift. At this point, the wing is in a stalled condition. In order for the wing to fly again, the angle of attack must be reduced. When the wing is below the critical angle of attack, the airflow smooths out and the wing produces lift again. It should be noted that an airplane stalls whenever the critical angle of attack is exceeded, which can occur in any flight attitude and at any airspeed. The third way of controlling lift is by changing the configuration of the wing. Lowering the flaps can increase the lifting efficiency of the wing and decrease the airspeed at which the airplane stalls. As flaps extend, they change both the camber and the cord line of the wing in the area of the flaps. This not only produces the lower pressure above the wing due to the change of camber, but it also changes the wing's angle of attack. Suppose that with the flaps up, the angle of attack is five degrees. By lowering the flaps, which changes the cord line, the angle of attack has increased to 10 degrees. This higher angle of attack provides more lift and more drag. The thrust necessary to overcome drag and propel the airplane through the air is produced by the power plant. If you look closely at a propeller, you will notice that it looks like a twisted airfoil. As the propeller turns, a lower pressure area is created in front of each rotating blade. This provides the thrust which moves the airplane forward. The force acting in the opposite direction to thrust is drag. There are two types of drag, parasite and induced. Parasite drag includes all the drag not directly related to the production of lift. It is generated by those areas of the airplane which disrupt the otherwise streamlined flow of air. This includes parts protruding into the airflow, such as the landing gear, rough surfaces, and the mixing of the air, such as where the wing and fuselage meet. As the speed of an airplane increases, the effects of parasite drag also increase. In contrast, induced drag is a direct byproduct of lift. It is greatest at slow speeds with a high angle of attack. Conversely, at higher speeds and at a lower angle of attack, induced drag decreases. If the two drag curves are combined and the values added together, there is a point where drag is at a minimum. This point is known as L over D max, which is where lift, when compared to drag, is at its greatest. In later sections, you will see that flying the airplane at this speed provides the best glide ratio and other performance benefits. The information presented in this section has provided you with a fundamental knowledge of the forces at work on the airplane during straight and level, unaccelerated flight. The next section will expand your knowledge of what happens to the four basic forces during maneuvering flight.